Thank you so much for that introduction and to all of you for joining us this afternoon. The breadth of the research we do in the School of Social Sciences for the betterment of the world is vast, so it was difficult to select just one area for this lecture. I considered several research strengths, but ultimately decided that health and well-being is an area with significant coverage and impact in the School of Social Sciences. So social scientists are interested in many aspects of health and well-being, including factors that make people more susceptible to disease, the ways that economic factors influence mental health, how stress gets under the skin to impact health, how policies have health ramifications and sometimes unintended ones, and many others. While socioeconomic factors have strong influences on health, poor health can also lead to lower educational attainment and lower incomes. So the linkages are complex. Every social factor seems to be related to health in one way or another. And social factors are by far the biggest drivers of health disparities in the United States. For example, we know that your zip code is a bigger predictor of your life expectancy than just about any other factor. Why? Because where you live is, of course, bound up in social factors, income, wealth, racism, and education, all of which have strong impacts on health and well-being. One cannot truly impact health disparities without social science. For example, a miracle vaccine cannot reach its full potential when there is vaccine hesitancy. An ingenious new medical device won't reduce health disparities unless it is broadly and freely accessible. In fact, new medical technologies and medications usually make health disparities worse, not better, because only the people at the top can access them. Similarly, health policies will only lead to better health if we understand how people actually make decisions within complex scenarios. These are the sorts of questions social science can and does tackle. Today, we will hear from three stellar junior scholars of health and well-being tackling questions like these. First up will be Mara Coughlin, Assistant Professor of Economics. So thank you everyone for coming out and for everyone organizing this event and for the invitation from Rachel. Um, so I'm from the econ department and I thought we should start with a little bit of background before I get into the research I was gonna discuss today. And so the first is what are economists doing talking about health in the first place? So I'd argue like many topics, economists have a lot to say about health, um, but specifically we have tools of causal inference and other ways in which we quantify health outcomes, looking at the impacts of policies, um, and in the case of my research, focusing on healthcare markets as, as markets themselves. And so specifically what I'm gonna talk about today is some of my work about how individuals navigate those complex markets. And so today what I'm gonna talk about is not on face the most exciting topic of how people choose insurance plans, um, but specifically in scenarios where we give people the choice over many insurance plans. Because economists say, you give people more choices, they're gonna find a better match, they're gonna be better off. And the evidence is a little bit more complicated than that. So I wanna take a step back and first think about a simpler case of plan choice for health insurance and how do economists think about it. So here I have a screenshot of my choice as a Rice employee. So ignoring this fifth sort of special plan on the bottom, Rice gives me the choice of four different health insurance plans. And these plans differ on their network breadth, um, their need for a PCP referral in order to see a specialist, the co-pays, the deductibles, the premiums. And so they're differentiated in generosity and ease of use. And so the question is, as, you know, as an economist, how do I look at this problem and make my choice? And so the way we think about this is that this is a choice all about uncertainty. I do not know today what's gonna happen to my health during the coverage year, and so I need to form expectations about what's gonna happen to my health, and then I need to think about the design of these plans and how do the plans turn my health needs into financial costs. And really, it's a distribution of financial costs that these plans are all gonna return to me because there's this probability distribution of these health events I may have, so there's a distribution of costs, and the economist in me says I have a taste for you know, risk and variance of costs, and I should compare these plans thinking about the out-of-pocket distributions they might return me, and I make the choice that way. I'm not sure that's exactly what I do in real life, but that is what The Economist does. And so the reality is that insurance plans are actually a tool for individuals to hedge against this uncertainty of health costs. And so you think about the scenario where I'm lucky, 
I'm super healthy, I have very few, if any, need to go to the doctor, and maybe I don't even use my insurance plan at all during the coverage year. I pay my monthly premiums, and so at the end of the year, I'm actually worse off financially than I would be if I didn't buy the plan because I've spent money and I've not used the product. However, if I'm unlucky and I get very sick or very injured, then I'm gonna use my plan a lot, it's gonna kick in, and it's gonna limit just how costly those bad health outcomes might be. And so this, it's this tool where in econ, the language we use is that it's a way to, to move resources, by which we mean money, between good states of the world where you're not sick and you have all these resources over to the bad states where because of the uncertainty governing your health, it might be really costly for you. And so the idea is if someone's risk averse, which we think most people are, then you're better off with some level of insurance than without it. And that's why there's demand for insurance in the first place. So the main modeling idea that economists use here is we think, okay, everyone has a personal risk preference and everyone has some personal uncertain distribution of health needs. And if you're more risk averse, you're gonna demand more insurance. And if you're less risk averse, you'll demand less. And by more insurance, I mean, you know, in the case of these rice plans, these plans with more generous coverage, lower deductibles, lower co-pays and, and whatnot, but higher premiums. I'm willing to pay more to get the reduction in the variance of, of outcomes that might occur. And so the classic approach, the way we take this theory and sort of implement it in modeling is that we specify what's called a utility function, so just a way to attribute a number to sort of your happiness with a product, and we describe that what you have utility over is wealth. Because again, insurance products are at their core financial products, and we model how people form these expectations of health needs. And then what we say is we say people have a preference for risk and these expectations over costs, and they're gonna look at all the plans you present with them, and they're gonna pick the one that delivers, in expectation, the highest level of utility. But shockingly enough, I'm sure, sometimes people don't actually seem to be choosing their plans in ways that are consistent with this modeling approach. And so today, in my brief time remaining, I'm gonna talk about one such market, and that's gonna be Medicare Part D. And so Medicare Part D offers prescription drug insurance um, for American seniors, um, it's only been around since 2006, and in those early years of the program, you know, even though it's administered by the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, these insurance plans are being offered by private insurance companies, so think Blue Cross, Aetna, Humana. Um, but in those early years, the typical senior was picking from between 40 to 50 different insurance plans. Today, it's about 30, which I would argue is still a very large number. I uh, was very stressed to pick from my four plans, because it was actually my first time ever choosing an insurance plan after studying it. Um, and so this is a really complicated market. And you know, when it came about in 2006, economists kind of jumped on this market and wanted to study how are people navigating and choosing plans, and what does that mean for welfare? Because this is an extremely regulated market. There might be room for policy to improve outcomes. So what's going on here? And they found, as I mentioned, that people are not choosing optimally, it seems. They're choosing plans that economists would deem worse than available alternatives. By worse, I mean they're leaving money on the table. They could have gotten a cheaper plan with lower you know, risk of costs than other available plans that they could have chosen. And moreover, it seems that the plans they are choosing are systematically related to plan attributes that don't really fit into econ theory. It's not clear why they put so much weight on this when they chose it. And so a lot of economists kind of slightly threw up their hands and said, in this market, people are not behaving optimally, they're not you know, choosing rationally, and our models aren't well suited to this choice environment. And so what my work is, um, is about modifying that model to better suit this environment. So before I jump into what I specifically do, I wanna give you a glimpse of what it <laughs> looks like to navigate the Medicare Part D world. And keep in mind, these are screenshots from today. It was much clunkier um, in the early years. So this is what it looks like if today you go to try to choose a Part D plan for Harris County, and so there's a few things I want to point out. They may be too small to see, but up in the left corner, there are 27 plans that are available to you. The website defaults to show you 10 at a time. So if you even wanted to see the name of all 27, you have to click through three different uh, page screens. Um, you see high level information about the plan. You can click further if you want to see more detail. But the main takeaway is it would be incredibly time consuming to go through and truly learn about all these plans and think about what they would mean for you. Um, and so if you think back to the early years when a senior was being asked to do this with a clunkier online tool and 40 to 50 plans, it seems a little um, unsurprising 
that we may suspect people aren't actually going to look at all 40 to 50 plans and make their, make their super rational choice from among those, among those alternatives. Um, so what my research does is it modifies the choice model in one specific way. And so the idea is I'm going to relax the main modeling assumption that after I sort of specify how you think about plans, you then stand and look at all of them and pick the optimal one. And instead, I assume, actually, for reasons I don't observe in the data, but maybe are related to budget constraints you have or liquidity constraints you have or prior experience you have with certain insurance companies, you're going to choose a subset of the plans. And it's only from that subset that you're going to evaluate them, do the research, and choose your optimal plan. And so what that means in practice, technically, is I model a preliminary stage in which before you, you know, evaluate your plans and choose them, every plan has some probability that you'll consider it, and it depends on these visible attributes of the plans themselves. So similar plans are going to have similar probabilities of being considered, but people are only optimizing among that subset. And so what I find, the punchlines, because again, not great on time, um, is that I do match the choice patterns in this market super well, but that's not actually incredibly novel about my model. There are other studies that have matched the data well with a regression with a lot of variables in it. Um, but what is unique is that my, my matching of the choice patterns comes along with fairly intuitive results that reconcile the econ theory and these empirical facts. And so the first is that I find a meaningful role for risk aversion, which economists think should underlie the demand for insurance in the first place. Um, and it's comparable to what economists have seen in other insurance markets where there's similar financial stakes. Earlier research found that it doesn't appear people are risk averse. And econ theory has a lot of trouble reconciling why you would want insurance if you don't mind risk. Um, and the second thing is my results are pretty intuitive and allow you to understand how, the, how people might be navigating. Um, navigating these choice sets, there's existing literature we could talk about for hours that yields pretty implausible results in my sample. And so it may be that giving people choice is not a bad thing. It's not that, oh my God, I don't know what they're doing. They don't know what they're doing. But simply that the process is a bit more nuanced um, than the standard model accounts for. And so more specifically, concretely, what I find in California in a specific year is that even though there's 19 firms offering plans, only three of them seem to be garnering much attention. And some firms, it seems that no matter what the plan looks like, no one's buying them. And people are clustering on plans with these really visible attributes that if you think back to the screenshot about uh, finding a Medicare Part D plan are the ones that you see really easily. So high deductible plans, people don't like high deductibles. Um, the highest deductible plan is only going to be considered 17% as often as a comparable zero deductible plan. High premiums, again, much less likely to even be considered, even if that plan might be a good fit for your health needs and your risk preferences. And then I do recover a distribution of risk aversion across the population, but even I, as an insurance economist, have to admit they're very hard to interpret the parameter estimates uh, by themselves. So what I've shown you instead is that if you think about someone with the mean average level of risk aversion, if you told them, okay, there's a 25% chance you're going to lose $1,000, 75% chance nothing happens to you, that person would be willing to pay you $57 to get out of that situation. So not huge amounts of money, not huge amounts of risk aversion, but much more meaningful than um, what we'd seen elsewhere. And so very quickly, um, I find that there's even though there's 46 plans that these customers are being offered, this is a distribution of how many plans people are typically considering. And you see that no one is considering more than 13 or 14. And almost everyone's actually considering fewer than five. And which ones they're, con they're considering are these ones with these very sort of shiny, visible attributes that people are, are really drawn to. Now, this I may not have time to go through, but by not considering all the plans, it might mean you don't actually pick the plan that given your risk aversion and your health needs would be the most welfare maximizing. And so what I can do in my model is I can give a dollar amount to the amount of welfare you're leaving on the table, taking into account your risk aversion. And I find that on average, people are leaving about $223 on the table. And that's about a quarter of what they're spending in the entire year in this market. And so what I can do is I can tweak the choice environment to see how much of that welfare loss we can recover. And I find that you know, if we randomly assigned people in these bottom two rows, they're really poorly off, which is pretty intuitive. But it does mean that choice serves an important role in this market, even if it's imperfect. But what I find in the second row is if you drop the quarter of plans that aren't average, the worst for people, you recover a little bit of that welfare loss, but not very much. But if you could get just one more decent plan into these consideration sets, which is what's in that middle row, 
you do actually recover a meaningful amount of the money being left on the table. And so it's not immediately operational, what should policymakers do, but it does suggest that there is room for improvement if we can just make this a little bit easier to process. And so I'm definitely out of time. Um, so thank you very much for taking the time to hear about how economists are thinking about this aspect of healthcare markets and how we're still doing work to make it more reflective of the, com the complexity of the markets and the complexity of the people. So thank you very much. And next up will be Christina Diaz, who's an assistant professor in sociology. So I'm going to be talking today about uh, the health and well-being of Mexican migrants who are coming to the U.S. And before I talk a little bit about this work, I want to just situate this talk today in sort of the larger projects of mine. And here I'm really interested in examining the health of Mexican migrants and how their health changes over time. Um, and I'm especially interested now in examining the sort of local community context and how that actually shapes who ultimately migrates to the United States. And so to answer these questions, I primarily rely on a large project called the Migrante Project. And these data are collected from my colleagues at Drexel University, um, the US-Mexico Border Health Commission, as well as other agencies. So one main motivation for me pursuing this work is that the Hispanic population, and specifically the population of Mexican immigrants, is they're much healthier than US-born Mexican populations, and they're also much healthier than US-born whites as well. Um, in fact, if we look at the data, Mexican immigrants report lower rates of mortality, lower rates of smoking and alcohol and drug use. They're much less likely to be obese and have any chronic conditions. And so people have argued, many scholars are kind of perplexed, right, by this seeming paradox because Mexican immigrants tend to fare pretty low in terms of their wages and ultimate educational attainment. And so this is, again, seen as sort of a paradox of good health given their low SES or socioeconomic status. And so, there is a growing uh, amount of work to suggest that the reason we see this advantage emerge in the literature is because immigrants, they're not representative of the overall population of Mexicans, right? If you think about the requirements needed to immigrate in the first place and leave home, chances are you have to be in some ways remarkably healthy or have some other positive attribute in order to make that journey, particularly across that Mexico-US border. So this is this idea of selection that immigrants are sort of unique in some way. And so in some published work that I've um, done so far, I have found some evidence that this is in fact the case, right? So I find that overall, recent Mexican immigrants are much healthier than immigrants who have come here decades earlier. Another thing that I have found in this work is that deported immigrants, they tend to be younger and they tend to be much healthier than immigrants who remain in the US. So this really suggests that the US is deporting and forcibly expelling the most productive and healthiest members of the immigrant population. In addition, I find that within population movement in Mexico, those internal migrants are much healthier than those people who never leave their community of origin. So all of this information and in sort of combination really suggests some evidence that Mexican migrants are not just a random representative sample. They're really unique in some way. So what I'm gonna to talk to you about today is I'm gonna go ahead and briefly assess the health of Mexican migrants over time. I'm interested to see whether this health profile has shifted over about a 10 year period. And I'm also interested in testing whether changes in state level crime, specifically violent crime, could be associated with the health of migrants. So you might be wondering, what is it about violent crime? 
Well, there has been in Mexico a dramatic increase in violence, specifically homicide, since 2010 or 2013. And so you see from this map, um, where you see darker colors signify higher rates of homicide, you see that um, we see violence that's pretty pronounced uh, along the northern border region, um, the sort of Tijuana era, area, and central Mexico. And this would really suggest that these um, areas have been really hit hard by violence. Okay, so how does this fit into health? So I'm imagining a couple of different scenarios potentially playing out. So on the one hand, it could be that increases in violence might be pushing out a more diverse population of migrants, right? Those people who are seeking safety or just wanting to avoid violence altogether. And this in turn would result presumably in a less healthy inbound flow of migrants. But on the other hand, it very well could be that violence and safety concerns actually make crossing much more dangerous, right, and risky. And so this could work to further limit migration to those who are already especially healthy. So what I do to measure this is I use the Migrante uh, data. I'm happy to talk more about the details during the Q&A or reception, um, but the one thing I do want to point out here is that these data are representative of the larger flow of migrants moving from Mexico to the US and specifically through the Tijuana border region. So of course there's a lot of different ways people can enter the United States, but this Tijuana region represents about almost 40% of the overall inbound flow of migrants. All right, so there are, of course, a lot of different ways that we could measure health. Um, I use a series of multiple indicators, including self-reported health, which, is, um, has, which has been validated in prior work in social sciences. I'm also interested in examining whether migrants report having any health limitations, as well as certain indicators of mental health. So the extent to which they felt calm, sad or had energy all or most of the time during the past month. Um, I then use these Migrante data and I link them to data from the Mexican census as well as the National Private Security Council data to generate estimates of violent crime at the state level. So this includes measures of homicides, kidnappings, robberies, um, among other factors. And again, I'm happy to talk more about these details during the Q&A. All right, so for the sake of time, I'm only gonna highlight a couple of descriptive findings. So this graph um, shows the percent of migrants who report having excellent or very good health, any health limitations, and again, um, certain indicators of mental health. The um, gray bars represent um, migrants who crossed the border in 2013, and the darker gray or black bars are those who crossed in 2020. And you could kind of see that just looking at physical health measures, we're not seeing a whole lot of action or difference over time um, between these two measures. But one thing that is kind of striking is that those migrants um, who entered in 2020 seem to have better mental health. They report just feeling um, much more calm and energetic, if you will. So when I generalize this sample of migrants to the overall population of migrants entering the United States, I find that immigrants who are men, who have some college, um, who have some college or a higher level of education, and those who are younger, they're much more likely to be in better health than women and people who are less educated and older. These trends don't vary over time, so this advantage persists across both periods of data collection. And um, preliminary evidence that I've generated so far suggests there's basically no relationship between state level violent crime and migrant health. And so I'm still sort of thinking about sort of what this means, but um, some data that is literally hot off the press right now 
suggests that amongst those migrants coming from high crime areas, a larger share of those are actually women. And so this is sort of, um, or this is especially the case in 2020, we did not see this gender disparity in the earlier period. Okay, so, well, overall, what are the implications of this work? So I argue that we really need to pay attention to the health of those entering the US, right? As Rachel mentioned, health is not only a key dimension of inequality and stratification, um, but these patterns really tell us something important about the extent to which the US should invest in public health programs and overall social services. Um, I also um, am thinking a little bit more about this change in mental health um, over time. Since I'm not seeing a ton of difference in physical health during these two periods, um, I'm thinking about sort of the general effects of COVID and how this has actually changed the composition of those crossing the border. So it very well could be that those in a more balanced or better mental state were actually able to handle the burden of crossing the border during this period of like market instability. So as part of my next steps, I'm really interested in linking data on non-migrants or people I call stayers um, to really make sure that I'm capturing something distinctive about migration flows and not overall shifts in the Mexican population. And I'm also going to explore how um, gender inequality and violence um, may be changing gender um, flows and the outflows of women. And so um, this piece or article was published just about a month ago that really highlights highlights this massive increase in uh, gender-based violence that um, women, both cis and trans women, face in Mexico. So, thank you. Thank you, Christina. Um, and our final speaker today will be Luz Garcini, who is an assistant professor of psychological sciences. Thank you, thank you for giving me the space to be here today. And I'm actually so glad that I went at the end because I was hearing you speak. I was thinking about all this so many ways that I need an economist on my, on my work and that I need a sociologist on my work to make it even better. And that's actually the purpose of my talk today. So not so much to talk about what my research is about, but what we need to solve these complex problems that we're facing today. So uh, my colleague just gave you a background in terms of the current immigration crisis that we're facing. And, uh, and the crisis is getting worse because the condition in the sending countries, it's, it's pretty, they're pretty there in situations. And we also have an outdated immigration system that is broken. So uh, in addition to the growing anti-immigrant rhetoric that is happening and the actions that are taking place. So with that context in mind, I want to point out to some uh, statistics from the U.S. Customs and Border Patrol. These are recent on the website. And if you take a look at 2017, on that year, there were about half a million total enforcement encounters at the border. Take a look at 2023. And this is a graph that I did on the first 10 days of January. We have more than half a million of encounters already. So what does that mean for this year? Also, we know that in the first 10 days of 2023, there were over 2,260 life-saving operations. In 2022, there were over 22,000 life-saving operations. So it is definitely clear that we have a crisis in our southern border that we are not equipped to deal with. Uh, and here is based on, uh, I've been in, in this line of research for 14 years, some of the different effects that we have found on the daring conditions that the migrants faced at the border. And we have them across uh, the board. In terms of the mind, you see different mental health disorders, depression, anxiety, fear, uncertainty, irritability. We also have their effects on the body. 
like increase our proneness to illness, chronic and infectious diseases. And we also know that these conditions break down their spirit. They sometimes struggle to find uh, meaning and purpose in their life to continue going, feelings of guilt and shame because of all of the implications of their undocumented status. So I want to take this opportunity to make a call of action and to think, given uh, how privileged we are to be in this institution, to try to think how can science help? How can we do, what can we do as scientists for the betterment of our world in regards to the current immigration crisis? And this is where translational science can give us hope is that can help us build bridges to use our science to address the complex social problems that we're facing. Uh, but in science, like in every day life, uh, we have bridges that look pretty, like the one on that side, and solid and pretty straightforward. But there are others that are more challenging, more difficult to cross and not so clear. Uh, in which many times we have to do a lot of trial and error and figure out new ways of doing things and understanding things. And my translational science work involves this type of bridges, and I'm sure it involves the kind of work that you do as well. Um, so this is the type of translational bridges that we must make to advance social justice, health equity, and to build a better world to live in. But to produce this kind of translational science, we need to adopt a transdisciplinary approach that explores relevant social issues by integrating diverse perspectives. The perspectives of multiple disciplines, each adding innovation, each adding new ways of doing things, of thinking about problems, different tools, different skill sets to solve these complex issues. So transdisciplinary approaches allows us to transcend boundaries to develop a more holistic understanding of the social problems that we face today. So in short, it's in bringing and incorporating new perspectives and methods that we, we can become better scientists for the betterment of our world. So I'm gonna use an example of my work uh, to tell you how I have incorporated in different disciplines and perspectives to transcend and be able to apply this work to, to try to address some of the health-related issues that migrants face. So voices, in English it means voices, started out of the need to document the prevalence of trauma and their implications of health for undocumented immigrants crossing the border. At that time when I started, uh, there was no strong, solid prevalence population-based estimate that would even give us a hint as to what was the situation. Uh, so at that point, uh, I used the combined expertise from various areas of psychology, various different fields within our, our, our field, in public health to conduct the first study to quantify the prevalence of trauma physical and mental health among undocumented immigrants from a population-based perspective. So currently, this study is in its fifth phase. Uh, it started in 2014 by conducting extensive formative research on both sides of the U.S.-Mexico border. Here you have the pictures in Tijuana, which my colleague was mentioning, uh, to learn how I could, how I was going to go about doing this kind of work, what I needed to do the best possible study that could be put forth. So to make this uh, formative research possible, I reached out and I collaborated with historians that could provide me an understanding of where, where the problem comes from. Why are we here today? Demographers, so that I could understand the complexities across both sides of the border, anthropologists and sociologists that could provide me the methodology to do this right. And they guided me in, in an understanding of the complexity of the issue from a different perspective that I possess as a psychologist. So together, that allows us to set the stage to allow to make the current phases that, that we have done successfully. 
So I use an interdisciplinary approach to develop a research protocol that is culture and context sensitive to the needs of these immigrants, and that I continue to use nowadays, even in later phases. Uh, there were many lessons learned, but unfortunately, for the sake of time, uh, I cannot elaborate on it. You, I'll be glad to answer your questions about that. So I'm going to fast forward a little bit to phase three. And in first three, I conducted the first uh, population-based study to obtain the prevalence estimates of trauma among 22,000 undocumented immigrants in the U.S.-Mexico border. Uh, you have some of our, uh, the peaks of, of, of us in the fields. But what we found was alarming and concerning. Not surprisingly, we found a tremendous amount of trauma. I'm not going to go into the results. I'll be glad to discuss. Uh, here is the manuscript where they're published. But uh, what was most interesting is that about half of those that uh, reported having complex trauma met criteria for clinically significant distress. And what that means is these people needed to be seen, needed to have access to treatment in a population that, that they don't. But for the purpose of today's talk, uh, I wanted to see, just like similar, in similar ways that my colleague did, I wanted to see how does these estimates of psychological distress compare to other populations in the United States? How does it compare to their documented counterparts in the United States and also to uh, non-migrant Lat white, Latin uh, white populations? And surprisingly, what I found is that there were significant differences with a health advantage for the undocumented immigrants. They reported the lowest prevalence of mental health disorders. And then I decided to run the prevalence for post-traumatic stress disorders. I was thinking, given the high prevalence of trauma, they're going to come at the highest estimates possible. And I was surprised to see that we had a very low percentage, only 3% met criteria. So I had two hypotheses for this. Either this is a highly resilient immune population to trauma, which I don't think that is the case, sadly, um, or, which is most concerning, our clinical measures and diagnostic systems are not accurately capturing psychological distress in this population because it presents in a different way that we traditionally conceptualize it within our Western philosophies. So this is concerning because if this is true, we don't have accurate measures and diagnosis to capture the stress in a population with the highest prevalence of trauma. So my science was not making a strong case as to why we need to advocate for these migrants. I needed something stronger. And that is when I turned my attention to biology because biology doesn't lie because trauma gets under the skin and the body keeps score. So I needed to document a more objective way in which trauma was, was affecting the health of migrants. So to do this in phase four and fifth, I collaborated with bioscientists, with physicians, and used biomarkers of stress in the field to see how this trauma-related stress was getting under the skin. And long story short, uh, we're still analyzing some of the biological data, but we have found that trauma-related stress is associated with greater risk of cardiometabolic diseases. This is cardiovascular disease. This is diabetes. This is hypertension, high cholesterol. So it is getting there somehow. And as, continue, as we continue to analyze this data, uh, we've been very fortunate that we recently received a grant from the School of the Social Sciences to take it even a step further, to see how trauma is actually affecting the brain, how it's actually getting in the way of our migrants being able to remember things, being able to learn things, so that we, that will allow us to collaborate with scientists in linguistics, in the cognitive sciences to even make stronger cases. So the knowledge that we have gained and that we continue to gain through the studies that have been funded, uh, we've been able to use it in four primary ways. This is the application. 
Uh, the first one is to inform the development of interventions to help us to reduce health risk and facilitate resilience in vulnerable populations. We can now use science to create resources to know this helps or this, this doesn't. Number two is to inform best practices and trauma-informed systems of care that we can deliver to physicians, to law enforcement, to collaborate with different communities and anyone that comes into contact with these migrants. Number three, we can use it, and most importantly, to inform advocacy and policy efforts. And we've been very fortunate to have extensive collaboration with Dr. Tony Payan at the Center for the U.S.-Mexico uh, at the Baker Institute of Public Policy, that I produce the research, I put it in his hands, and he make the policy implications happen. And number four, and very important, is to train the future third generation of transdisciplinary scientists that will continue to carry on with this much needed work for the betterment of the world. So in closing, I provided you an example of how collaboration with scientists from different fields of studies can help us advance ways in which we can address complex social issues such as the current migrant crisis. We need translation and efforts to solve these complex problems, but the translational science to succeed needs to be transdisciplinary. We need to work together as scientists from different backgrounds to make this happen. So I'm gonna end with a question uh, for you to think about. How can we, at RISE, make it a powerhouse and a role model for propelling translational, transdisciplinary science for the betterment of the world? Thank you. <laughs>